My name is Nina Vojanovic, and I'm an economist from the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. And today's presenter is Banu Damir Pakel from University of Oxford. This event is part of the serious seminars in international economics, which our institute organizes with the recent Center in International Economics. And these seminars are intended to be a forum of presentation and discussion of current research findings in the field of international economics. We cover a very hot and up-to-date topics in international trade, foreign direct investment, and migration. So let me just tell you about the format of, of this seminar. Uh, Bana will have up to 45 minutes for her presentation, and then we will have 50 minutes for question. My suggestion to you is to ask the question after the 45 minutes elapsed, so after the presentation, and you can ask the question either by raising your hand and directly asking Banu, or basically by, by writing your question in a chat. If something is unclear, you could also write during, a, during the presentation, but again in a chat, and I will collect these questions. So the event will be recorded, mm -hmm. and both the slides and the recording will be posted on the www website, after the event, you will receive in your email um, an online survey how, which we kindly ask to fill out because the point of the seminar is to over time improve. And uh, I'm saving the last, the best bit for the last. I will give an impressive, a very impressive uh, description and biography of Banu Demir Pakel. She is an associate professor of economics at the Department of Economics and tutorial fellow at Bronson College, uh, University of Oxford. She's currently on leave from Bilken University in Ankara. She worked in various institutions from 2016. She's a regional affiliate of the Center for Economic Policy Research in the International Trained and Regional Economics Program and an affiliate of the SASE for Research Network. She was previously also visiting assistant professor at the Princeton University, and she also worked in the World Bank from 2006 to 2008. Her research is in the intersection of international trade and development economics, focusing on how firms adjust to trade-related shocks and how their adjustments shape their aggregate economic outcomes, which much of it will, we will see during this presentation and interesting discussion. She has a PhD from University of Oxford, and also she has an economics degree from Bilkent University and Middle East Technical University. So Banu, the floor is yours. You can slowly start, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Sinyo, for such generous introduction. Uh, by the way, if it's not a problem for you, I'm happy to receive the questions during the talk as well. Okay. Uh, no problem. So, I mean, it's, I think, better to make it as close as possible to a usual seminar, more interactive. Uh, absolutely. We, we can yeah. make an interactive as well. You, I can, yeah, but I'll try absolutely. to finish 45 minutes to have a like more detailed discussion afterwards, but I'm happy to receive questions during the talk as well. Great. Perfect. Um, okay, thank you very much for the invitation and also for taking your time to attend the, uh, the, the, the seminar. Um, so it's a great opportunity to be able to present my work uh, here. Um, so the title of the paper is Orient Production Networks, and let me give you the punchline of the paper uh, before going into details. Uh, so the, 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 the main idea or main result of this, of this paper is that uh, trading with high income countries could enhance skill upgrading in developing countries, not only by direct exporters, but also by a broader set of domestic producers through input output linkages. Our uh, starting point in this paper is Michael Kramer's seminal work on ordering production processes. Um, so in his, in his theory, um, uh, in, in, in Kramer's model, production requires a continuum of tasks, uh, and, and he also assumes a, a, an extreme degree of complementarity across, across different tasks. And in this framework, he shows that the value of a firm's output drops dramatically, uh, even a single task fails. So 
the main result is that then firms would, that produce high quality products would be willing to employ skilled workers for every task required for the production of the final good because these skilled workers are less likely to make mistakes. And this would imply a strong within firm clustering of skilled workers. But in today's world, we know that not all tasks are performed within the firm. Indeed, a significant fraction of tasks or inputs, you can use the terms uh, interchangeably, is, is actually outsourced to other firms. So if, you, uh, if one applies Kramer's logic across firms, then we should expect skill intensive, high quality firms to trade more intensively with each other. But then a firm's choice of quality or skill intensity would depend on the same choice made by its customers as well as suppliers. When deciding whether to upgrade uh, quality, the firm uh, would be willing to do it to the extent that its buyers value quality and also to the extent that its suppliers would be willing to provide high quality inputs to this firm. So in this paper, we, we argue that this interconnection of quality choices across firms might shed some light on the success of export promotion policies in, in, in developing countries. And we also discuss the conditions under which uh, such, such policies would, would succeed in, 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 in these countries. Okay, so before going into details, let me briefly explain the mechanism we have in mind. So consider an, um, a policy where the government uh, provides subsidies firms for finding uh, customers in foreign countries. Both developing country and developed country governments, for instance, provide subsidies for participating in trade fairs. This is just an example. Now, from a developing country point of view, it's okay to assume that demand for quality in the, in the foreign country is higher than firms that benefit from these subsidy programs would be willing to upgrade their quality and skill intensity. But remember that exporters are large. So maybe they account for a small share of manufacturing firms in almost every country, but these firms are quite large. This is one of the most robust findings in empirical trade literature. So when they upgrade, they simply increase the probability that other firms match with higher quality firms in the domestic market. So on the one hand, matching with a high quality buyer increases demand for quality. So that's gonna bias demand in the domestic market. And on the other hand, matching with a high quality supplier would simply decrease the cost of quality upgrading for other firms. So therefore, non-exporter firms would also be upgrading. So this implies a, an amplification of the, gen, of, the, of the original shock in general equilibrium. So if you think about quality upgrading as a form of technological adoption, then our results are related to this big push literature or hypothesis, which emphasizes um, complementarities in, in technological adoption and how these complementarities would lead to uh, potentially large general equilibrium effects of quite small shocks. Um, so in the paper, we proceed in, in two steps and that's what I'm gonna be doing during the presentation as well. So we start with empirics and in the empirical part, we use very detailed micro level data from Turkey. So the highlight of the data set is uh, this VAT, um, VAT data where we can observe firm to firm transactions, uh, trade transactions within the domestic economy. And using this detailed data, we first verify two necessary conditions for this amplification channel. So first, skill intensive firms trade more with each other. So measuring skill intensity using average wages, so I'm gonna be showing you results with, with different measures of, of skill intensity, but using average wages, we find that there's strong positive assortative matching on wages in a production network. So, um, in other words, there's a strong correlation, positive correlation between buyer and supplier wages. So there are two channels that could, or mechanisms that could generate this result. So on the one hand, high wage firms might be more likely to match with high wage firms 
This is what we call the extensive marginal sorting. Or maybe everyone is matching the same set of firms, but given the same matches, high wage firms might be spending more, relatively more on their high wage suppliers. So this is what we call the intensive marginal sorting. And in the data, we find that both channels are actually quantitatively important with the extensive margin contributing about 60% to the overall correlation between buyer and supplier wages. So this is the first necessary condition for this amplification. The second one is that we need exporters to respond to demand shocks uh, or demand shocks coming from foreign countries. So we employ a ship share regression design. I'm gonna uh, tell, uh, explain the details later. And we find that uh, when there's, a, there's an exogenous positive demand shock originating in rich countries, then exporters upgrade their quality and skill intensity. So we observe an increase in own wage but we also observe an increase in average wages of its suppliers and buyers. And uh, exploiting the details of the VAT data, as well as matched, matched employer-employee data, we find that actually a, a, a significant part of this, of this supplier-buyer effect is, is generated by the formation of new connections, either in the, in the, in the in, um, in, in, in labor market or uh, in terms of business connections. Next, uh, with these empirical findings in mind, we build a quantitative trade model featuring heterogeneous firms and with endogenous firm-to-firm -firm network connections. So here we borrow a lot from the, um, the, the labor literature in terms of uh, search and matching. And the model also has endogenous quality choice by firms. And we achieve this by introducing quality complementarity into the production process. And we estimate the model using simulated method of moments. And we find that the, estimated, uh, the estimation matters well, the joint distribution of firm size, wages, and, and business degree distribution, both on the supplier and buyer side. The extensive and intensive margin uh, of, of exporting in the data as well as these novel facts about uh, sorting on wages or skill intensity and the shift share response of firms to trade shocks. And quantitatively, we find that both the quality complementarity in the production process and the, the, the directed search towards the firm's own quality segment are quantitatively important to explain, to explain the propagation mechanism. So now with the estimated model, we can talk about general, general equilibrium policy implications, right? Um, so in the, in the empirical part, we are exploiting idiosyncratic shocks, idiosyncratic export demand shocks. But what happens now if all exporters in Turkey receive a 5% export shock? We find that with the with this general equilibrium setting, within this general equilibrium setting, the, um, the, the export, this, the same shock uh, generates an, a, an increase in the overall skill intensity that is nine times larger than uh, in what we find in the empirical analysis exporting idiosyncratic shocks. And indeed, when we write down a simpler version of the model, after getting rid of this quality complementarity and directed search in the, in, the, in the market for business connections, we get a very similar result to what we get in the empirical part. So both quality complementarity in the production process and directed search towards the firm's own quality segment are quantitatively important to explain this propagation. An endogenous network structure also matters. So if we assume a fixed and homogenous network in the sense that all firms have the same number of business partners and their distribution is the same in terms of skill intensity, then we can only get half of the response that we get in the, in the, in the, in the, in the baseline model. So then we can ask, uh, so what is the effect of an export promotion policy that subsidizes firms um, search for uh, customers in foreign markets? 
So we find that through the lens of the model, such policies could be potentially quite powerful. For instance, a 9% uh, subsidy, um, a subsidy that reduces search costs by 9%, which is not a very costly policy in terms of household income, would generate a substantial increase or quality upgrading in the domestic economy and increase in manufacturing wages. But we make a couple of strong assumptions here. So we are, for instance, assuming that there's a constant supply of, of skilled workers into the manufacturing sector, which may not be so realistic. And we are also assuming that trade can be imbalanced, right? So we are not, uh, we, we, are, we are not allowing the exchange rate to, 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 to adjust. But if we drop these two assumptions, we find that the, the propagation it would be much weaker. So this highlights the importance of education and training policies together with trade policy, as well as and being able to sustain um, some, some trade imbalances so that the currency will not appreciate too much. And these are actually very consistent with what we have observed in the East Asian uh, export-led growth, uh, growth uh, experiences. Okay, so in the in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the literature. As you can see, there are lots of papers, and uh, uh, our paper is related to multiple strands of literature uh, from uh, an, an older literature on big push uh, hypothesis to the more recently growing literature on 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 on, on networks. Uh, and to, I think we do a quite good job to 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 summarize. Uh, what, what these uh, different strands of literature are doing and, and, and how our paper is related to that in the, in, the, in the paper. Okay, so let me start with stylized facts. So the first one, as I said, so the first necessary condition is positive sorting on wages in the production network. So how do we show that? Um, first, we need a measure of skill intensity and baseline, we are just using average firm level wages. So what is an average firm level wage? Just divide the total wage bill of the firm uh, with the number of workers the, the, the firm has. And then once we have this measure for each firm, we can also construct average supplier wages. And what is the average supplier wage? Take the average wage of each supplier and weight it by the importance of that supplier in the buyer's total input purchases. So it's gonna give more weight to, 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 to suppliers that the buyer is relying more, uh, more in terms of input purchases. And using this, this measure, we find, uh, we, we simply regress the, the, the ever supplier wage on, on, on buyer's wage, uh, controlling for the industry and province. So we are looking at within the same four digit NACE industry. Uh, so NACE, as you know, is a standard industrial classification used in the EU um, within the same uh, NACE industry and, and Turkish region, say Istanbul. And we find that a 1% increase in uh, buyer's wage is associated with an almost 0.26% increase in average supplier wage in the, in the economy. So you might say wages are very correlated with size. So can we control for that? Yes, we can do it. So in, in column three, we control for the size of the firm. The coefficient estimate becomes smaller, but it is still quite, quite sizable. Um, in most of the analysis, uh, we are just focusing on manufacturing to manufacturing flows. But if you include other firms like trading firms or, or, or other service firms, you still see a, a quite, um, quite positive. Indeed, it's very similar to what we get for manufacturing to manufacturing network, uh, very strong um, uh, sorting, uh, sorting on wages. Now let's decompose this. So as I said in the beginning, this correlation could be driven by two things. So one is um, firms might be, high wage firms might be more likely to match with other high wage firms. To be able to capture that, we can simply use the unweighted average. So we are not going to, we are going to treat all suppliers the same, regardless of how much the buyer buys from each of them. And the intensive margin then becomes the uh, difference, simple difference between the total that we defined before and the extensive margin, which is simply the unweighted 
uh, unweighted average. So if you look at it, it, is, it almost looks like a covariance, right? So it's gonna be positive if the firm buys more from suppliers that have an above average wage rate. So that's, that's gonna be, uh, so given the same matches, I remember in the beginning, I explained that given the same matches are high wage firms purchasing relatively more Right or relying relatively more on other highway suppliers, so that's going to be the case if 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 this if this product is is positive. So thanks to the beautiful features of OLS, right? So we can uh, decompose the total correlation here exactly into the extensive and intensive margins, right? Um, so when we replace the total um, or total weighted average with the unweighted average as well as the intensive margin, we find that almost 60% of the total correlation here is uh, coming from the extensive margin. So extensive margin is important, which means that, yes, it is true that the set of suppliers that high wage buyers are, 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 are choosing is actually very different in terms of wage or skill intensity composition than, than, than uh, low wage buyers. But it is also true that the intensive margin matters, right? So even the matches are the same, even a high wage and a low wage buyer matches with the same supplier, the high wage one will be purchasing relatively more if this is a high wage buyer. So this is the intensive margin and it accounts for about 40% of the total correlation. We do a lot of robustness checks. I don't know whether you have anything in mind to, 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 to propose. Uh, please let me know if you have any, uh, but let me explain what we have done. Uh, so we did take the geography more seriously. So buyers and suppliers located in the same geographical location might be subject to the same labor market shocks. And that might sort of explain this positive correlation between the wages. Um, so when we only when we restrict the set of suppliers only to those which are located outside the firm's own geographic region, we still get a very strong um, positive correlation. We use alternative measures of skill intensity and quality, including a more direct measure of quality that is proposed by Kandavov, Schott, and Waste paper. Uh, so we exploit the export, um, detailed export data, unit values, and market shares to be able to recover quality. Uh, and there we also observe a, a, a strong positive correlation, and we also exploit the link to employer employee data and use um, use estimated worker uh, worker fixed effects uh, to be able to get a better uh, measure of, of, of skill intensity that is not relying on the current wages that the then that the worker is 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 uh, receiving uh, from the current employer. Of course, there's some uh, heterogeneity in terms of uh, in terms of industries, but uh, while um, the the correlation is always there, regardless of which industry you you you, you look at, uh, there are some usual suspects where you would expect a stronger um, uh, quality quality um, uh, stronger sorting on quality, like motor vehicles, uh, for instance, um, paper products, rubber and plastic products, electronics, and so on. But for apparel leather products, furniture, the correlation is much, much smaller. But interestingly, the decomposition into the extensive and intensive margins are, 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 quite, uh, are quite robust. Okay, now this was using regressions, right? We can also look at the raw data. Here, uh, what we do is that we sort firms based on their, their wages after uh, residualizing their wages according to their industries and, and, and provinces. Let's sort them and then group them into quintiles to, 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 to five groups. And then we simply aggregate um, the, 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 the purchases of each buyer uh, in, in, in each quantile across different wage quantiles of, of, the, of the sellers. So uh, all rows here add up to one, right? So because for, for each buyers, let's say this is the lowest wage, uh, the buy, buyers in the 
lowest wage quantile, and this gives the distribution of their purchases from different uh, different types of, of suppliers. Now, there's a uh, there, there are two messages here. So first, if you look at the fifth column, right, um, it is always dominating the rest. Why? Because high wage suppliers are also large firms. So they are, regardless of the of the um, the wage quantile of the buyer, they since they are uh, since they are also big, right? They are dominating the the the, the purchases of of, of different uh, different buyers. But what we are interested in is really how these numbers right change as we move from the lowest wage buyer to the highest wage buyer. So for the lowest wage, as uh, for the buyer in the lowest wage quantile, the highest uh, the sellers in the highest wage quantile account for 40% of, of their purchases. But when it comes to the buyers in the highest wage quantile, the most skill intensive ones, the, 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 the fraction increases to almost 85%. So this is what we really understand from, uh, from sorting. And that's what we observe also in the, in the raw data. So we are not gonna use these numbers in estimation to, uh, in, 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 as a moment, but these are going to be providing some, some sanity check for us um, after, uh, after, we estimate, uh, after we estimate the amount. Sorry, Banu, this is Nina. a very interesting um, slide. Uh, basically, you don't hear, these are any suppliers no matter the industry they they, they yes to. so we are so we, we are demeaning we their wages from 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 industry averages because if it's in some industries wages might be yes. higher compared to other industries mm. just because of the industrial characteristics regardless of the of the characteristics of the firm okay i see okay yeah we first demean and then we sort uh and then we sort firms and what does this links? Uh, what is the link? Oh, link. so this is this is total expenditure. Okay, so so thank you very much. I was I was uh, I was almost skipping that. So this is total expenditure. So in other words, this is the total sorting in the mm -hmm. in, if 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 we if we want to make a similarity to the uh, earlier measure we constructed, and this is in terms of number of links. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how many uh, of these links are, 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 are um, as a fraction of the I number see. of things. So without paying any attention to, uh, to, to, to the volume of sales between buyers and, uh, buyers mm -hmm. and sellers. So this is more like the extensive margin. I see. And okay. here, what we care about is really the, 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 um, uh, how um, diagonal uh, is, 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 is looking like. So mm -hmm. here we get more than fifty percent of of links are um, for for a high wage uh, high wage buyer is is with other high wage sellers in the in the market. Okay, it's all very clear. Good, thank you. And it is uh, it's not surprising that this is much higher than this because remember that this this expenditure one captures both the intensive and extensive margins, mm -hmm. but this is just the uh, this is just the extensive margin in terms of number of links. Perfect. Now the second um, uh, second fact or second necessary condition that we need to verify in the data to be able to argue uh, the propagation is how firms respond to demand shocks originating in, in rich countries. So to be able to do that, we employ a shift share regression uh, design. Um, it is now it's popular, many people are doing it. So I'm sure uh, many of you are, 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 are familiar uh, with, the, with the setting. Uh, so what we do is that we construct export shocks at the, at the firm level by looking at the composition, the product country composition of the firm in the beginning of the period. So these are the, um, the, the shares of uh, country uh, product pairs right, in firms total sales at the beginning of the period. And the second part, Zs, are import demand shocks. So we simply look at, for instance, in Austria widgets, right? So how much widget imports in Austria changed over five year period, excluding its imports from Turkey, because we don't want Turkey to be included in these shocks, right? So because we wanna construct 
really exogenous shocks from Turkish firms point of view. And we weight these import demand shocks at the product country level with the importance of that particular product country pair in firms total sales in the beginning of the period. So this is a standard shift share, um, shift share variable. What we are adding to this is this third bit. And remember that we are not after the scale of the demand shock, right? We don't really care about whether the firm receives a big shock or a small shock. What we care about is the composition of that shock in terms of quality. So following the literature, we believe that um, fair, uh, countries, high GDP per capita countries have a demand that is biased towards high quality products. So widgets imported by Austria should be of higher quality compared to the widgets imported by Nigeria. So that's the, that's the, that's the variation that we wanna capture. So to be able to capture that, we interact the standard shift share uh, components, these shares and shifts with the GDP per capita of the importing countries. So we simply wanna give more weight to the positive demand shocks or demand shocks that originate from high income countries. Okay, so that's the, that's the only tweak that we are introducing to the standard uh, shift, share, shift share regressions. Uh, sorry, one yeah. more question, Bano, because yeah. it's, it's very interesting. Um, these export shocks, do they cover all the countries or just the con developed countries? They, so they cover all countries. All, all the countries, but Since weighting, but weighting the, 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 the richer ones with higher GDP per capita more. Absolutely. So they cover all countries, but uh, we weight these shocks with the GDP per capita of the of the of the of the importer Perfect. just okay. to be able to give more weight to shocks that come from Austria versus Nigeria yes that's the, the idea the purchase higher quality absolutely oh, okay. yeah. I, I wish data they use for this because my understanding was that you use this is UN com trade this okay. is UN com trade okay Perfect. yeah yeah so I mean except so it, this is UN com trade uh, obviously, this, since this has firm component, uh, we, we, are, uh, we, we, we have to use the firm level uh, customs data, firm mm -hmm. product level customs data in Turkey mm -hmm. as well, because we want to uh, we want to give more weight to product country pairs that are more important in the firm's initial export portfolio. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a one question from a chat, which is basically yeah. very similar to, to what I ask: Is this shock also from developing? countries yes, yes but they are not weighted as much yeah so they are weighted but their weight is smaller smaller so we, we are giving as since gdp per capita of those countries is smaller we are going to give less weight to developing countries compared to developed countries that's perfect. that perfect thank you uh, so we start with the standard shift share variable, which is not adjusted for the income per capita of the importer. So it is positive, uh, but, the, um, but the magnitude is small and it is not statistically significant at, 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 at conventional levels. When we replace this um, shift share variable with the one that is adjusted by the GDP per capita of the importer, the coefficient estimate doubles and the standard errors become smaller. So it becomes both um, economically and, and, and statistically significant. So in, uh, what, what we find is that, so a 5% or a 10% export shock will simply increase average wage of the firm over five years by 0.4%, or a 5% shock will increase it by 0.2%. Now, what about average supplier and buyer wages? So these are uh, weighted by, so this is, the, the, I'm, I'm using the, 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 the initial measures that include both the extensive and intensive margins. Uh, so there's quite a, a, a significant increase in average supplier wages. This could be coming from many, many channels. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, talk about it in the, in the next slide. Uh, there's also the, uh, the effect we find on the average buyer wages is very similar to what we find for on the supplier side, but it is imprecisely estimated. So it's not significant at the conventional levels. Now you might say, 
So firms are increasing its, its wages, but it might simply be reflecting increase in the size of the firm, right? Um, so when we look at what happens to the market share of the firm in the domestic market, we don't find an effect. Actually, it goes in the negative direction, but it is true that the firms becomes more export intensive. So the fraction of export sales in firms total sales, including domestic sales, is simply increasing with the with the export shock, and this is what 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 you would uh, you would expect. So I usually pause here <laughs> to see whether there are any questions, any um, any any suggestions for robustness checks. Uh, if if you have any questions, I'm happy to to to, to answer. Uh, well, yes. Uh... I, I just like the presentation, so I just keep on asking. Uh, okay. But I hope I don't I don't swallow the entire time. No, no, uh, no, no, no. So basically, these are just backward and forward linkages, right? In, in a way, supplier and, and buyer. So basically, of a firm that is exporting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, uh, but as I said, so this, now we are including all suppliers when constructing. Oh, mighty, mighty. Uh, let me let me answer this. We are we are we are including all suppliers of the firm in the uh, in the whether it is an existing supplier in the beginning of the coming from the beginning of the period or new ones. In the next slide, I'm gonna I'll, I'll try to disentangle these different channels. So how much of it is coming from new suppliers? How much of it is coming from existing suppliers? Marty has a has a has a question. Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, Hi, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. So as far as I understand, uh, this is the uh, first layer supplier, right? So yes, but but in your data, it is possible to see even the second layer, third layer, right? Yes, is I'll, I'll come to that. So oh. you're absolutely right. So we can look at second tier, third tier. So it's, we can we, we are just looking mm -hmm. at suppliers of the firm, but we can actually look at suppliers of suppliers, suppliers mm -hmm. of suppliers and suppliers and 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 so on. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to that. So it's one of the channels okay. actually mechanisms that I'll talk about in the in the next slide. But yeah, it's, great question. Yeah, it's we, interesting we to see that. if the it's interesting to see if the effect uh, Gets smaller, yeah. higher degrees yeah. of, 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 of connections. Yes, yes, yes yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Okay, thank you. So, since the question was about that, okay, so first let me, um, let me start with new connections, right? So, how much of the effect is coming from new connections? Uh, so, first, let's start with connections in the labor market, right? So, what can happen at the, at the firm level. So the firm can, is now selling higher quality products, maybe to, uh, to, to rich countries. So it has to upgrade quality. But what we are seeing in the, in the regressions in the earlier, in the, in the previous slide might simply be profit sharing, right? So profits of the firm are increasing. So regardless of whether the firm is upgrading quality or skill intensity or not, the firm might be sharing part of the profits with, with, with workers. So we might observe an increase in, in, in average wages. So that's one explanation. Another explanation is firm might be substituting towards high uh, skilled workers or more, skill, more skilled workers. So to be able to capture that, we are, we are exploiting the LinkedIn, LinkedIn employee to employee data. We are able to track workers across firms and over time. So what we do here is we take the ratio of the um, uh, average wage of the firm's new workers after it received the shock, right? Um, relative to the average wages paid by the firm at the beginning of the period. But the good thing is we are calculating these wages of new workers at the beginning of the period as well. So these are the wages paid to workers by their former employers, right? Because it is also possible that now this export, this, this firm is receiving this positive shock, it is expanding. So it might simply offer higher wages to these workers to be able to poach them from other firms, regardless of the skill level of the, of the, of the worker. But if the worker was already being paid higher wages by the initial or former employer, 
then yeah, so it, it the, 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 the mechanism we have in mind becomes more convincing. And we find that yes, it is true that the average wages of new workers at the beginning of the period was already higher than the average wages paid by the firm at the beginning of the period before it, it received the shock. So there is some substitution towards high wage, high skilled workers. So this is on the worker side. We can do the same thing for suppliers and customers of the firm. So this is the average wage of new suppliers to the firm's uh, average supplier uh, wages at the beginning of the period. Everything is constructed, calculated at the beginning of the period to make it clean of the shock the firm is receiving. Um, and we find that uh, on the as uh, similar to what we observe in the labor market, the market in the market for business connections, the firm is simply switching to, to, to more skill intensive, high quality connections, both on the supplier side and on the buyer side. But there are other mechanisms. So this is one of them. This is sort of the extensive margin, right? Substitution. But another thing that could happen within the firm is that the firm might simply be uh, increasing its purchases from its high wage suppliers, but that continue throughout the period. So the firm was purchasing, was, uh, was sourcing from the supplier. It is still sourcing from the supplier, but because of the quality upgrading, the firm might be increasing its reliance on this high wage supplier. So it looks like it's an important mechanism. So firms switch. So we are talking about within firm switching of spendings, right? Firms switch material spending towards continuing but more skill intensive suppliers. We don't find evidence on the buyer side. And what about responses by trade partners? So this is Related to Marty's question, so we look at the, um, the the average wages of continuing suppliers, first degree, second degree, and third degree. We find some weak evidence on this, on the existing suppliers, but it looks like the effect disappears pretty quickly with the with the net network distance. So it's already very close to zero when it comes to the second degree suppliers, and it disappears completely for in the in the third degree. Banu, there is one question in the chat, uh, yeah. how we can calculate the high skilled labor. So it's uh, um, wage spending per worker throughout the whole time, correct? Uh, so you mean, okay, so we, we, we use two different measures. So one is, yes, the, the average, um, average wage uh, paid to the worker in different periods of time. So we are doing it at the, at the beginning of the period. Mm -hmm. But in, um, in another exercise, uh, we are uh, estimating a mean serial regression and uh, recovering the worker fixed effects, mm -hmm. right? And we are simply uh, looking at how these these worker fixed effects are changing uh, within within the firm over time. So whether the firm is switching to to high uh, fixed effect uh, workers because these fixed effects are simply capturing the lifetime wages received by the worker, not only the the the, the current wage paid by the uh, paid by this by this firm who received the shock. So mm -hmm. both measures are actually. Um, giving similar results. Good, thanks. Okay. Uh, um, so third one, and uh, I'll be done with the empirical part. I'm just going to use five minutes on the on the on the theory. Um, so uh, the third fact is not actually new. Um, the other papers using similar firm-to-firm -firm trade data have documented this. So sales is the largest determinant of the size of the firm's business connections, both on the customer and supplier side. Uh, what we are really interested in here is whether the wage becomes an important determinant of the size of the business network, it looks like it isn't. So neither the R squared is changing when we uh, add wages as an additional uh, variable, uh, or it is not uh, esti estimated to be statistically significant. So wage or skill intensity of the firm determines the composition of business connections, but not necessarily the size. And this becomes an important thing in the, on the, when, we, when we write down the model. And another important fact, so why exporters? 
exporters are large and they are well connected in the data. So when they receive a shock, their effect for the aggregate economy is very different than uh, what you would expect when uh, other types of firms receive the same shock. So they account for less than a third of uh, manufacturing firms in the data. So this is consistent with, 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 with findings in other data sets, but they are in almost 80% of firm to firm transactions. So uh, it, it, almost 80% of transactions includes at least one exporter. So that's what it means. And these transactions account for 91% of domestic trade. So while we don't see exporters everywhere. They have a very important role. They have a very central role in, 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 in the production network. That's why shocks received by these firms are important for general equilibrium. Okay, so I'm gonna be very quick. Nina, would you give me five minutes? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank more you. than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the closed economy and I will tell you what we are adding to uh, extend the model to, to, to the open economy setting. There are two sectors, service sector is very, very uninteresting, homogenous good, constant returns to scale, perfect competition. But in the manufacturing sector, we have heterogeneous firms that compete in monopolistically competitive markets. Now, each firm is characterized by two parameters omega zero and omega one. So omega zero, you can think that of as the absolute advantage of the firm. So the overall productivity of the firm, regardless of which quality segment it is operating in the market. Omega one on the other hand governs the firm's competitive advantage in producing high quality products. So a firm might draw a very favorable favorable omega zero, but a very bad omega one. It is possible. So we are allowing that. But remember, we are going to estimate the joint distribution of this omega zero and omega one in the data. Mm -hmm. And there's also a parameter that is common to all firms that's omega two. This omega two simply governs the curvature of the productivity schedule, right? Um, so it's gonna. Uh, so we 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 don't want uh, we don't want the quality choice to go to infinity, right? When uh, a firm picks a very favorable omega zero and omega one, so that should be that should be a cost to do that. And this omega two will be an important parameter for understanding the 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 the, shift, the effect of shift share shocks. Right. So we won't be able to identify omega two from cross section data. We need those shift share regressions to be able to uh, inform us about it. So in the production function, we are introducing quality complementarity. How do we do that? So there's a very standard CS aggregate uh, that you may you may you may remember from other papers. What we are doing is we are introducing this extra bet phi y. Now, what is that phi y is doing? It is simply changing the marginal product of inputs depending on the quality of the output being produced, okay? Mm -hmm. So a high quality input has higher marginal productivity. It is true regardless of what the buyer is doing, but this marginal productivity advantage is increasing with the, with the, with the quality of the output being produced. Mm -hmm. And what parameter, which parameter governs that? It is new Y. We are not restricting the value of new Y for now. This is something that we will be estimating structurally later on. But if it is positive, then uh, this phi function becomes log supermodular. In other words, the, 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 the marginal, as I, as I said, the marginal product of high quality inputs will be increasing with the quality of the output. So this is the first important ingredient. The second one is the network, right? So firms endogenously choose how many upstream and downstream ads to post in the market to find buyers and suppliers. The trick is we are allowing firms to direct their search, right, towards different quality segments, right? So um, what we are doing is, let's say this is a buyer 
in this particular quality segment. So this buyer is posting ads to find uh, to find buyers mm -hmm. in every quality segment here. But the thickness of these arrows simply tells us the fraction of posts, right? Or fraction of, of ads posted in different, in, in different quality segments. So there's a mm -hmm. within firm distribution of, 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 of uh, these ads. And that's gonna govern the extensive margin of sorting. And this part is going to govern a little spoiler since I don't have much time. Uh, this is <laughs> this is going to govern the, the intensive margin of sorting. So the model is extremely simple, um, or maybe not simple. But what we get is very simple. So we get a very um, we, we get a log linear specification for firm level profits. So if you think about it, it is very similar to what we what you would get in a in a in a in a Mellis model. Right, but with a different, with with some uh, new components. So there's a profit shifter that is quality specific, so market specific. It has a demand component and a cost component. So firms' interactions with each other, this endogenous network formation and quality choice, would show up in these two uh, components of the of the profit shifter. So firms will be taking this as given, but these will be endogenously determined within the model. Uh, and what does a firm do? It chooses the quality that uh, that generates the highest highest profits uh, for the firm. So as I said before, the extensive margin will be governed by this directed search. So there's a within firm distribution of ads, and the intensive margin will be governed by this quality complementarity component in the production function. And uh, the two parameters that we are really interested in here is new Y. So we will be estimating the, the strength of this quality complementarity using new Y. And the variance of this um, of this of this distribution will tell us how much we should care about the directed search. In the open economy, we assume the uh, demand, uh, the foreign demand is exogenous and it's, it is potentially uh, increasing with quality. The relative demand in the foreign market is potentially increasing with quality if foreign has higher demand for quality. But this is something that we estimate as well. Okay, um, so directed search is imperfect, but it is still significant. So if you, consider a very high wage firm, a high quality buyer, still 8% of ads end up in the lowest quality segment, but 65% comes from the highest quality. So it is significant, but it is imperfect. What about the intensive margin quality complementarity? As I said before, high quality input always has a higher marginal product, but this uh, productivity advantage is very, very large for the, if the buyer is also in the high quality segment compared to a buyer in the lowest quality segment. So this is, uh, this, this already tells us that the quality complementarity is pretty strong. Right, now we can consider a 5% shock, now not idiosyncratic shock, but all exporters in the country receive this 5% shock. Uh, we find that through the lens of the model, now average wages increase by 1.9% and it increases even for non-exporters which have not received this shock directly. So this is the general equilibrium amplification of the, of the shock. And both the demand and cost component for quality upgrading is, are, are contributing to this, to this result. I'm not going to talk about the um, mechanisms here, uh, but I will directly jump to the export promotion policy, as I promised before. So what happens if the government, for instance, gives a subsidy uh, to firms for, uh, for covering part of the uh, search cost in, in, in foreign markets? Uh, it, it, it generates a quite uh, a large increase in the in general equilibrium in terms of um, in terms of increase in in overall scale intensity. Um, but as I said before, um, if you do, if you assume an upward sloping uh, skill skills, uh, skilled worker schedule in the uh, in the domestic economy, which means 
the, the, the labor supply is not elastic, is not perfect elastic, then the, the effect becomes much smaller. And if the government allows the exchange rate to appreciate, then uh, you would also see a much smaller effect. So both education policies and, and, and uh, trade uh, imbalances uh, matter a lot. So just a few words. Um, it's not only about, so traditional export-led growth development strategies rely on the scale of exports. So we didn't really care about the composition of exports. What we are trying to say is maybe it's not only the scale, but where you export also matters, particularly if you're a developing country. And thank you very much. And I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, Mona. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed uh, by the paper. Uh, by you. the way, I will just give a few comments before I open the floor to the question. So uh, everyone should now think about uh, the questions that you want to ask uh, Banu. This is a really unique opportunity to discuss this paper because it's it's very good. It uh, uh, counts more than 100 pages and I was uh, very curious to see how Banu will he will manage the time versus uh, I couldn't. actually the quality of the paper and how much it's covered there and I think you've done a, an amazing job I'm impressed mm -hmm. so um, a couple of points um, you use a very very interesting data set micro level so basically in my understanding you you connect firm level uh, firm data set with employees data set and you can basically track also yeah. uh, where these employees move which I think is very unique and now it's a po possible in Austria, but I see that in, in Turkey, uh, this is the case too. Yes, 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 it is. It is. So we are able to track workers uh, over time as well as across across firms. So each worker has a unique ID as firms. Uh, perfect. And, and, and why do you choose this period of time? It was just a matter from 2011 to 2015. Um, so there's a there's a couple of reasons. So first, um, there's a change in in reporting threshold for the VAT data um, mm -hmm. after um, after 2011. So we get a more consistent. So the threshold change is minor. Uh, it shouldn't affect any results, but still, it gives us a, a, I mean more confidence that we are we are uh, we, we are treating the uh, data the same over time. So that's one reason. Second. We didn't want to deal with the um, uh, the global financial crisis. Absolutely, uh, that was my first. I thought it was a very good period of time because you avoid all of these yeah. shocks. Yeah, uh, we could yeah to to to, to avoid that, and also uh, we are able to track firm uh, track workers. Uh, so linked employer employee data is useful only after two thousand eleven. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also a reason. But I mean, we could have used we could have used uh, I mean earlier data for the exercises that we didn't uh, rely on uh, linked employer employee data. But the first two uh, two two reasons are also important. Okay, I'll I'll go with one more question, then I'll give a word uh, to Magdi. Uh, so basically, in one estimation, you look whether uh, the whether firm trades more uh, with high quality supplier or whether its quality improves uh, because of the new employees mm -hmm. that pulls away from other companies. Did you exclude multinational corporations that pay higher wages in general? I so, mean, do you actually focus only on Turkish firms? Because that was not clear to me. Is it only local firms or all firms? It is all firms, but you're right. So we we, we have, uh, I think, two or three robustness checks where mm -hmm. we um, look at foreign firms separately or we drop foreign firms from the analysis uh, at all. Uh, and it looks like it's not driven by, by, by foreign firms mm -hmm. operating in Turkey. But it is true that for foreign firms, the, the sorting is, is, is pretty significant as well. Magdi, you have a question. Yes. You raise uh, your, uh, your hand. Yes. Uh, well, uh, in order to understand what you presented, uh, so you wanted to show how the firms match with each other. And in order to do that, you had some or less regressions showing the relationship between the wages of companies that are the buyers or the suppliers. But to me, the 
choice or the selection of the buyer and supplier uh, is like, you know, it's like a one and zero choice. It's like a profit model rather than an oilless model. So it's a, it's a, assuming that we have a big matrix of all firms so that we have firm to firm relationship, then we need to have these relationships in like a panel database or, or like a huge cross section of uh, relationships and then we can have a profit and then with this profit we can uh, define how this probability increases if the wages of the companies are closer to each other. Mm -hmm. it, it, but I didn't see such a profit model in your analysis or am I understanding it incorrectly? So we are trying to understand, you're absolutely right. Um, so first we are trying to understand what the composition of, we are not trying to explain selection, but we are trying to understand the composition, the supplier or buyer composition of firms. Uh, and that's why we use this weighted uh, value or trade or value weighted, uh, weighted average of, of all suppliers. Uh, and we say, okay, so we did, in the decomposition, the extensive margin goes a little towards uh, what, you, what, what you're suggesting, but only for the average, right? But we are not looking at individual suppliers or individual buyers. But we ran the regression or something similar to what you have in mind, it's logit. So what you can do is you can run a logit um, regression where you have a zero one variable on the left hand side, whether the buyer is purchasing from that particular supplier or not. Of course, remember we have around 120,000 manufacturing firms within a, in a given year. So what you need is, uh, so each, so can you think about the structure of the, of the data? So for each buyer, you will have 120,000 rows. Uh, because the, this buyer is purchasing only from some of these suppliers, but it's not purchased. So the network is pretty sparse. But what we did is uh, we included all zeros and we included a random sample. Uh, we included all ones, so existing relationships, and we included a random sample of zero. So then uh, estimating with logit becomes feasible. And in that regression on the right hand side, you can include size, you can include wages or other variables you can think of. Yes, wage is an important determinant. We find that. But it is not really what, so that coefficient or that relationship is not really what we are after because in, in our case, it is a continuum of suppliers. So it is a roundabout production function. It's a continuum of suppliers and a continuum of buyers. So what we can keep track of is only that composition, right? So the averages, that's why. Mm -hmm. So is it the similarity in the composition or similarity in the structure of firms that lead them to link to each other? Or so, is it the other way around the causality is coming from the link and then goes to the wage? So, so, so the, the, when you say structure, so the uh, one competing uh, explanation or determinant is actually size, right? Uh, size definitely matters because so larger firms, so in all this literature, larger firms are more able to pay the fixed cost of searching, right? Mm. Uh, so any transaction, any link, is more likely to have a larger firm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but control and what, what matters is controlling for size, whether wage also matters and it matters. So that similarity matters. So high wage firms are, are matching with high wage firms. But mm -hmm. here and it, is, it is very tricky in a logit model to run this, um, this, this uh, horse race, right? Between, between size and, 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 and wages. Mm. Okay. We are only able to do it so through the lens of the model. So if you remember this, uh, yeah, I was very fast there, but omega zero and omega one. So you can think of omega zero as something as, as a parameter that governs the size of the firm and omega one wages. So that's why it's very important to estimate uh, the joint distribution of wage and, and size in the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
one one short question i mean uh, i have many but then uh, we should also control the time um basically are you looking in your data only at the suppliers from turkey or not international suppliers, right? Unfortunately, we don't observe foreign partners in the customs data. So this, so this, uh, this VAT data comes mm -hmm. from, um, I mean, Minister of Finance. So this is this was this is collected for administrative reasons, not for research purposes, um, to to track uh, VAT payments, mm -hmm. uh, to keep track of VAT payments, and to control, uh, I mean, inf control for informality, to con to check informality. Um, unfortunately, in the customs data, uh, we do not we do not observe. So the only place where I can observe foreign partners is customs data. Unfortunately, it's not reported there. I think names of foreign firms are reported, mm -hmm. but there's no unique idea, and they're not making the uh, the 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 firm names, foreign firm names, available to researchers anyway. Um, and one more question. Um, Usually, firms um, try to still go for some costs, you know, uh, for cost efficiency in in their production, and they would maybe opt for suppliers that are in their close geographic proximity. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, is there? Are you trying at all to 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 dig into this part that you know that firms basically in a smaller geographical scale trade with one another? It is true. It is very true. So most of the connections are very local. Um, this is more, this is, I think, true, most of outside manufacturing. So manufacturing is, 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 is traded. So uh, they don't have to be, uh, they don't have to locate uh, very close by. So we are not taking the geography seriously in the model because there are so many parts uh, already moving parts in the, in the model. So we are not taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. But in the, when we look at the sorting regressions, we are worried that we were worried that maybe suppliers, if firms are disproportionately supplying from local producers, mm -hmm. and uh, then these firms would simply be subject to the same labor market shocks, local labor market shocks. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the positive correlation we are finding might simply be reflecting the local uh, local labor market conditions regarding instead of instead of sorting so that's why we um we dropped all firms uh firm suppliers in the same region as 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 the buyer itself and re-ran those regressions so it looks like it's not coming from local labor demand shocks uh sorry labor uh local labor market shocks but, but other than that, we are not really taking it seriously. So there's a paper by, um, there's a recent paper by Kostas Arkolakis, Yuhei, and uh, Federico Hunings. Uh, so they're using Chilean data. The model is in the same spread, it's a working paper, mm -hmm. uh, the, in the same spread as our model. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead of looking at quality, uh, they are uh, trying to understand the geography of firm to firm connections. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're interested in that, it's a, it's a great paper. Uh, so you may, uh, you may, you may want to, uh, you may want to look at it. So they, they are taking the geography very seriously. That, that, that's very trade. good. I will, I will look. I thought it would be very good to, to look at both things, uh, knowledge proximity or skill, uh, quality proximity versus geography proximity. But I think there is a lot of work ahead in the research. Banu, I would like to extensively thank you. I think this your, your piece of work is, is just amazing. Uh, I, I read it and I'm impressed uh, also by how you structure this uh, presentation. So I can only tell you congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure it will be a really well published paper and I can only thank you for the opportunity to present this work to us. I thank you. Um, I'm also, oh, Makti, do you have? Okay, no, Makti is clapping, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also clapping as well, but I have to mediate as well. So, Manu, thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. I hope you stay in touch, and I would like to thank participants as well. Uh, please fill out the survey. We would like to improve our work and interact with you as well, even after the seminar. Uh, so, Yes, I would like to uh, close the seminar now and invite you for our next one, uh, next one, Banu. Again, thank you very much.
Thank, thank you. you very much. I for absolutely enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. And I'm uh, very happy to meet you. Uh, and I hope we can we can meet in person uh, soon. I think things are going in the right direction in terms of COVID. So I'm sure I, we'll see each other in some conference or, or, or somewhere else. Absolutely. And I hope we host you one day here in the Institute. I mean, Vienna sure. is beautiful. Well, it's beautiful during the Christmas time. And sure, yes. <laughs> sure. I would be happy to. Thank you very absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you and bye to everyone. Have a nice bye. evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.